The speaker of uh, today's speaker uh, put too many slides and he said that maybe... <laughs> no, Do no. I have something which can, can oh, yeah, turn the page? The page... Uh, Oh, you can oh, just use yes. this. Okay. So, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, didn't video. Uh, uh, okay. So yeah, the, uh, today's speaker is uh, our own uh, professor in our faculty, Si Wang Han. Um, that uh, he's um, he's from the condensed matter experimental group, and uh, he's going to talk about the. Uh, and so I want to thank him uh, for you know being here today and give us this uh, this colloquium that uh, we're very excited to hear about his results on. Uh, quantum uh, materials, quantum information processing. Uh, we had, a, I think, last year we have also a topic about this. And in case you don't know, next semester we have five, six colloquium about, uh, about this topic. So Professor Han is going to educate us and tell us what type of questions we should ask to the faculty candidates <laughs> next semester, right? Because we're going to have a lot of topics about this. So let's welcome Professor Han. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thank you. So actually, uh, next semester, maybe we're not going to hear you know, five or six talks about you know, exactly about this, because I, I, I glanced over the you know, applicants. There are very few of them are doing this, OK? But, but it's going to be you know, the, uh, some, somehow related. So uh, this, hopefully, this will be also you know, just like an appetite for you guys, OK? Ready for next semester. OK. Uh, first, you know, this is my outline. Uh, why we need a quantum computing? Then, I'll, and there, then I will sh uh, show you in particular the superconducting qubits because there are many different ways of to you know to physically implement quantum computation or quantum information processing. Use the physical different physical systems like you know trapped ions, neutral atoms. You know, spins in semiconductors and, you know, the nuclear spins, you know, electronic spins, uh, blah, blah, you know, uh, even like, you know, the quantum dots, semiconductor quantum dots, and, you know, superconducting qubits. Uh, the current status of the field is that the superconducting qubits and the trapped ions are the two most advanced, you know, technology. Okay, uh, all the others are still you know, uh, in the catch-up state, and some of them are already being written off as being you know, with you know, uh, one, one, way or, you know, one short, shortcomings or the other fundamental shortcomings. Now, I'll briefly you know, the, introduce what is logic gates. Uh, this I means logic quantum gates, okay? which basically is just unitary transformations on the state of the system. Uh, Circuit QED, that's one tool uh, which naturally combines with superconducting qubits very well, and that function as in a very good you know, the, uh, way of to process and you know, propagating quantum inf information. Uh, finally, what, you know, why you know, we have not seen a true quantum computer? Because you know, this noise and the decoherence problem. That, that's the problem. You know, we are still trying to you know, overcome. Okay. Then I uh, report some most recent development. Uh, see what is the status of the. So why quantum computing? Uh, briefly speaking, okay, in classical computing, basically we we use it every day. Okay, your smartphones, your PCs, your laptops, they all you know use uh, uh, classical computing. So, the information is uh, is treated you know, in the form of a binary. Okay, so we encode information in the zero and ones, you know, a string of zero and ones. Now, what the computer scientists call efficient computation, that means the computation time scales polynomially with problem size. For example, in the in the, in the uh, if you want to search uh, uh, one particular item in an unsorted database, you know, like you don't have a you know, real yellow book which is already sorted for you, right? Alphabetically, it's just you know a bunch of you know the unsorted records. Then on average, you have to search, you know, n divided by two if you know there are n items in that in that database. Then you have to search on average n divided by two times in order to hit your target. Okay, so in that case, then that search is something like you know 
people in this field, according to find the needle in the haystack, you know, is scales linearly with the you know, size of the problem. So that means, you know, if you have uh, the problem size is 1,000, say, you know, you have 1,000 record, unsolved record. If the time, you know, the search is, you know, is one second, then you need to, uh, this, this computer has some problem. You know, I, I probably will have a lot of problems, you know, because these are all the font which cannot show, show up. This one does not have the font, necessary font to show it. So if A equal to, you know, you increase the number of, you know, of the items of the problem size by 5%, this is only 5%, then of course, you know, then the time required also increases by 5%, okay? Uh, but linear, you know, linear dependency is not you know, the only type of polynomial scaling. You can have like, you know, the any, you know, force power for some particular problem. Then in that case, if you know the one problem which has a size of 1,000, require one, you know, one second, then if we scale as a force power, then you would need 1.2 you know, seconds, roughly, okay, to the first order approximation. So that's not a big deal, right? So that's, you know, the computer scientists call, you know, this, uh, you know, the classical computing is efficient. But there are also inefficient problems. Uh, computation time scales exponentially. For example, if, you know, to factor, factoring a large number into it, uh, two primes, then well, well, we know that that problems in you know, the computational time scales as a two to the nth power, power exponentially. So if we have a problem which you know same at you know size of one thousand takes one second, then as the n increase to you know time by five percent, this increase from you know, say one second all the way to three point three million years. Okay, so that's why you know the factoring is such a you know the hard problem. Uh, which then people use it to, uh, as you know, the you know foundation for you know RSA encryption, you know, measured. Now, so there's a also there's a race for the world's fastest supercomputer. These are all classical computers. So this is time, year two, 2005, year 2020. Okay, that's next year. So currently, the fastest supercomputer is uh, Summit which has a uh, you know, computing power of 200 petaflops. One petaflop is uh, 10 to the 15th okay, per second, you know, uh, float point operation. So the projection is, you know, the by maybe, you know, 21, 22, then uh, hopefully we can get to the extra scale, okay? Now you say this is the famous Morse law plot, right? This is, you know, this is a log, semi-log plot, so it's, almost like a straight line, okay? So that's, uh, you know, so-called Morse law. But this cannot continue, not just only because, you know, the size of the transistor already, you know, the, uh, almost get to the limit of the physical, you know, physical limit where, you know, the quantum, you know, effect has to be taken care of. And the technologically is, you know, uh, it's going to be very costly. Also, you know, the power, okay? If you look at this, this one, that's, uh, uh, it takes 10 megawatt to operate it. And the power scales not as the, you know, the, uh, we, there's another plot I didn't show. So power scales almost linearly with you know, the computing power. Not exactly linear, it's less than linear dependence. Something like you know, the uh, power of 0.7 or 0.6. But even that is very you know, large. So, by going to here, you probably already goes to, you know, so this is a, you know, thousand time, right? Jump from here to here, change. Then you have to multiply this by several hundred. So that means, you know, the computer, you know, extra scale computer will need something like, you know, the uh, several thousand megawatt, okay? Or a few gigawatt of, you know, electrical power to run. So, this obviously cannot, you know, the, uh, cannot continue. So uh, quantum computing, then basically this is first in the proposed by David Deutsch in 1985. Uh, he demonstrated, you know, there's a so-called, you know, quantum parallelism. Uh, basically, you know, uh, to the, you know, uh, uh, watered down explanation is that, you know, say, if I have, uh, you know, say a uh, register, quantum register, 
consisting of n qubits, right? Each qubit can, well, their basis state is 0 and 1. But I can put them in you know, any superposition state of the 0 and 1. Then the product state, or the tensor product state of this n qubit is, uh, it can simultaneously represent you know, 2 to the nth power of you know, the uh, information. Now, so if we, I do a unitary transformation on this you know, state, then that unitary tra transformation simultaneously acting on, or acts on you know, all these you know, 2 to the nth powers of states. Okay, so just by one stroke, I change you know, every you know, state or coefficient of every state. Okay, then uh, Schultz algorithm. This is the one which you know the really got you know people excited because you know this exactly is uh, you know it's Shaw uh, demonstrated that algorithm quantum algorithm that can factor you know the big numbers into you know its primes and uh, you know time scales as you know the uh, polynomial with the size of the problem, not exponentially. Okay. So that got everyone you know, uh, excited and starting work on this. You know, uh, before that is just a theoretical proposal. You know, people say, "Oh, nice," but you know, how are you going to build one? Or and if you really build one, what problem are you going to you know use it for? Okay, then Grover's algorithm uh, that is you know the 1996. So uh, I'm not going to talk about these three. These also are the you know the sub branches, sub fields of the quantum information processing. One is the quantum simulations, you know, and this actually is uh, in the recent uh, 10 years, it got uh, developed very, very, very rapidly. So recently, uh, there's a one group in Harvard, uh, they use uh, neutral atoms, and another group in Maryland, they use trapped ions, uh, simulated some, you know, the Hamiltonians in the condensed matter physics, and uh, with uh, more than 50 qubits. Okay, and if you want to try to solve it, you know, the use a classical computer is is going to take you know very very long time. So this is also a very active field. Another field is quantum annealing. If you have uh, heard of this uh, company called D Waves in Canada, okay, they they actually sold several of these uh, quantum annealers. So that can be basically are used to solve the constraint, you know, the uh, optimization problem. So any problem that can be you know, converted into a constraint optimization, you, know, you, can, you, you can run it on the you know, quantum alleler. Now, uh, a third of the, this approach is called adiabatic quantum computation. It's different from the ones I'm going to present here. It's called circuit model or circuit con con computation. Uh, this is more related, more closely related to the, the way we used to, to do the you know, computation, that is we program. We know we start the system in a, in a, in a known initial state, right? Then we just you know, the, uh, write a program, you know, command by command, and say, doing this unitary transformation, doing this, doing that, on this qubit, this qubit, blah, 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 okay? So it's just like you know, the uh, language. But this one, this one is similar to you know, analog you know, computation. You basically you know the code the solution of the system into a final the eigenstate of the final Hamiltonian. Then you start it from a Hamiltonian, which is easy to realize. Okay, then change the, you know, the parameters of the Hamiltonian gradually, adiabatically, until you know the, your Hamiltonian becomes the final problem the Hamiltonian. Then you simply read out you know the what is you know the state of the you know final your ground state of your last system. So your ground state of the system corresponding to the solution of your problem. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about this. Okay, uh, so I think I already you know, uh, spent too much time on this. Now, so what are the, you know, the uh, two unique quantum resources we, we use? One is you know, quantum superposition. This you know, every, everyone knows, right? If our computational basis is, you know, say, uh, G and E, ground state versus excited state, Sometimes we, we use ground state first excited state, sometimes we use zero or one. Okay, so this computational basis is basically zero and one. Usually ground state is zero, excited state is one. Okay? Then if we have one qubit, we have zero one, we have two qubit, we have four basis state. 
So this was 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, et cetera, OK? So if we have an n qubit, then we have 2 to the n of you know, the uh, basis state, computational basis state. Now, arbitrary n qubit state can be written as uh, a superposition of the, you know, the basis state. This i is just a basis state, depends on what is you know, the dimension of the Hilbert space. Okay? It can be you know, either 2 or 4 or, you know, so it's uh, or 8, et cetera. So, uh, the, of course, we know this is required, right? The square modulus of the probability amplitude, you, you know, arithmetic up, sum of this should be equal to 0. Okay, then the other is called you know, quantum entanglement. Uh, uh, so any, any multi-particle state which cannot be written as a direct product, you know, direct tensor product of the single particle state is an you know, entangled state. Okay. So basically, uh, in, in this case, if it's an entangled state, then you, you cannot call this is a system of two particles because you, know, you cannot separate these two particles. You don't have a you know, single particle state anymore. Okay. What you have is you, know, you have a, you know, a two-particle system. It's not a system of two particles. Okay. Then uh, for, for a single qubit, then we use the block sphere you know, representation. This is a geometric representation to show you, you know, what is uh, uh, if a quantum system is just only have two levels, so that is Kerber space is two dimension, then it can be parameterized as cosine theta over two, zero, plus, you know, sine theta over two e to the i phi, the uh, one. Uh, this is wrong, okay, this is, uh, uh, this is correct, this is zero. So uh, in the block sphere representation, then this, is a, this sphere has a radius of one, because then you say this square plus this square, okay, modular square is equal to unit. Okay, unity. Now the theta then is this vector's angle between the you know, z, z axis and you know, the state vector psi. Then the phi is angle between its projection on the xy plane and the x axis. Okay. Uh, later we'll see. You know, we will use this uh, picture uh, often to to show you know how quantum processing, information processing works. Uh, I'll scale, you know, skip this. Uh, this basically shows, you know, how the quantum parallelism works. Uh, now, this is a so-called DiVincenzo uh, criterion. DiVincenzo is a physicist in, or use, he was in IBM Yorktown Heights. Now he moved to, to Europe or, or to, he, he moved, you know, to a different place now. But this is the famous, you know, the DiVincenzo criterion, so which tells you what physical system can be used, you know, uh, to implement, you know, the uh, quantum computation. Uh, first, it has to be scalable, okay, uh, with a very, very well characterized qubit. Then the ability to initialize the state of a qubit to a simple uh, fiducial state, like you know, if like you know, if you even cannot control, you know, what kind of, you know. Your start point. What is your starting, you know, initial state? If you, even if you cannot, if you cannot control that, I mean, you cannot take, you know, you cannot do anything, right? How you are going to do you know, the, then program it? So this is the second one: uh, initialization, uh, long relevant coherence time. Sometimes people say it's decoherence time. Some people say coherence time. They mean same thing, okay? Uh, it's just like you know the, you know, uh, half bucket of water is you know, half empty or it's half full. So it's in the decoherence or decoherence. Then uh, it should have a universal set of quantum gates. Universal set of quantum gates means uh, there are we only need two types of quantum gates. One is the uh, uh, two qubit gates, uh, another is you know, the single qubit rotation. Then we can implement every you know, uh, unitary transformations for you know, multi-qubit system. Then also, uh, we need a qubit specific measurement capability. Means we need to be able to you know, determine what the state of each qubit is at the end of the computation. Otherwise, how you're going to you know, read out your result, right? Uh, this, this last two basically is uh, uh, you know, related more to the you know, quantum communication uh, than quantum computation. So I'll skip it, okay? So here are a list of you know, the Cartoons, you know, about you know, the uh, several 
physical systems that can be used to implement uh, you know, uh, qubits. So this is uh, you know, the superconducting, superconducting qubit, or you know, it's, this is just a superconducting. Actually, this is not, not a superconducting loop. You have a capacitor, you have a you know, superconducting inductor. Why we need a superconductor? Because you know, it does not dissipate energy okay, at, at the low temperature when it's a superconducting. If you use a no, normal metal, you can use a normal metal to make you know, the, uh, like you know, copper or silver or gold to make you know, the LC, uh, LC resonant circuit. But that the resonant circuit were, you know, what the, you know, uh, the Q value, or you know, if you put some you know, uh, excitation into that, it will dissipate it very quickly mm -hmm. to the, you know, the electromagnetic environment. And then these are the trapped ions, you know, silicon quantum dots, topological qubits, and the diamond uh, vacancies. So if you s see some people talk about MV centers, that's this, MV centers, topological qubit. So far, I don't think even you know, people have demonstrated just one qubit yet. Okay? They're still working on it. Uh, but it, 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 theoretically, you know, it is supposed to have some good advantage. That is, you know, it's, uh, it's very robust against you know, noise okay? because it's protected by topological orders. And uh, this, uh, there, there are also people working on this, but uh, it's, it's not considered uh, you know, the viable candidate. And trapped ions is also quite advanced. So currently, it's a, it's a competition between superconducting and the trapped ions. Okay? So what is a superconducting qubit? Uh, superconducting qubits basically can, why we use superconducting qubits? First, you know, it's a low dissipation. You know, that leads to long coherence times. Design flexibility is basically you know, the integrated circuit, a thin film integrated circuit. So we can use all you know, the uh, modern advanced uh, integrated circuit technology to make it kind of fabricated. And so that is scalable. We can make, you know, very, make it on a you know, big wafer, right? You can make you know, millions or even you know, the 10 millions, 100 millions of qubit. And this, uh, it, we can design so it has readily tunable energy levels controlled by microwave and you know, voltage current pulses. So uh, we, we already uh, developed you know, the quantum non demolition state measurement. That means you know, when you measure the system, you don't just crash it. Like, you know, there are, you know, most of the quantum mechanical textbook will tell you, you know, you measure it, you collapse it, right? You collapse it into some, you know, eigenstate. Then every time afterwards you measure it, you're always in this eigenstate. Now we have a way to measure it which will not collapse it, okay? So that clearly you know, indicates that collapse theory is not correct, okay? Now, uh, readily coupled by simple circuit elements like you know, inductors, capacitors, you know, blah, blah, these things, okay? So basically just inductors and capacitors. Now integrate with uh, superconducting, it's easy to integrate with superconducting resonators and cavities, okay? Because they're all you know, superconducting material, we can use the same materials to do this. So, uh, first, let's see what is a superconducting LC oscillators. If we have a simple LC oscillators, right? Then we can write down its Hamiltonian uh, Lagrangian. Then we can do a transformation, a gender transformation. Then we got Hamiltonian. Uh, so it's already 24 minutes. So it's, I'm on a pace of something like two minutes per slide. It's too slow. <laughs> okay, so I have to uh, skip some of them. So in, in this case, basically. The flux in the in the in the uh, uh, the flux in the loop and the you know, the charge on the capacitor, that's you know the uh, canonical you know variables of the system. Okay, so the phi actually plays the. If you look at this this equation, this term is like what? This is like a kinetic energy, right? And the C is the uh, you know this this fictitious particles mass, and you know phi dot. So what is phi dot? That's velocity, right? So phi is, you know, is the phi basically plays the, you know, the role of coordinate or the position of the particle, or x. And you know, this phi, uh, so phi square, okay, phi dot is, is the velocity, phi is the, you know, the position, okay? So this is the, connect, you know, the uh, potential energy part. Then if you do this, you know, the uh, transformation, you've got the Hamiltonian, which has two terms, you know, the, you know, the P squared divided by 2M. This is equivalent to that. This is, you know, the one half of, the, you know, the 
kx squared. So that's, that's basically you know, it's just a harmonic oscillator, right? So it's a, it's a potential it's a harmonic oscillator. If we solve it, we got you know, equally spaced you know, energy levels. However, this is not good. Why is it not good? Here is just some you know, uh, additional information you can use to, you know, to do quantization, you know, change it from you know, the phi and, and, uh, and, P, uh, and Q to you know, A and A dagger, you know, the creation and you know, the annihilation operator. Or, you know, the now, a uh, typical value, if you take C equal to 1 picofarad, A equal to 1 nano Henry, then we got you know, this uh, energy separation is 5 gigahertz. Okay, okay, which is very nice to, to work with. Okay. You don't want it to be too high, don't want it to be too low. Okay, too high, then if you go over, you know, say 20 gigahertz, uh, it's, it's very expensive. Everything is very expensive. Now, however, there's a fatal uh, uh, problems with this system is that, you know, if you use, if you, you, you can initialize your system in the ground state, then you apply a resonant microwave to it, then the system actually will, you know, start to climb first to this, then climb, climb, climb. It will go over, you know, every place. You cannot isolate it into you know, just the bottom two levels, okay? Because you know the same frequency also resonant with the you know, energy difference between the you know, second and the first excited state and third and the second excited state, etc. So it will go, you know, it will make system you know goes into so you know, occupies the entire you know the uh, you know Hilbert space of of this this object, okay? But we we want it to just stay in the you know the bottom two states, okay? So here, Joseph and Junction come to rescue. So Joseph and Junction is basically is a two superconductors separated by a very thin layer of insulator. So this is a Joseph and tunnel Junction. It has a, a DC Joseph effect. You know, I equal to IC sine phi. Phi is the you know the phase difference of the wave function or the, you know, the superconducting order parameters. You know, of the two sides. Okay, the difference. So this side is theta two, this side is theta one. Difference is five. I see is the maximum critical current, maximum supercurrent it can carry. This structure can carry. Above this, and then you start to have you know the voltage. Then the uh, average voltage actually is uh, proportional to you know the rate of the change of the phase difference. Okay. So uh, uh, I just you know the leave here. Then let's see what these two equations imply. So what these two equations imply is that Josephson Junction actually, from uh, you know, electro electronic engineer's point of view, is just a LC resonant. Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a non nonlinear inductor. Okay. So what do we, do we mean by nonlinear inductor? Now let's see. We can write you know with some notation here, EJ so called Josephson coupling energy which is proportional to the critical current of the junction. These are just H bar and E, electron charge. Then V, we can write it as V L G. So this is nonlinear Josephson inductance, okay? So we can, we can derive this nonlinear Josephson inductance using, you know, the ordinary, well, basically use the first, you know, the, use the sec first and second Josephson equation, okay? Use these two equations. Uh, I skip, you know, the, this, you know, if you are interested, you, you can do this yourself. It takes probably, you know, two minutes to do it, okay? Uh, so finally, you can find out, you know, the, this Joseph Junction's inductance actually depends, depends on the phase difference between, the, you know, the two sides, okay? So if you plot it, actually, you know, say you can from the first Joseph equation, you can see if there is no current through the junction, the phi is zero, okay? If phi is zero, then what is this? Cosine phi is what? It's one, right? So then the, it has the smallest you know, inductance. Now, as you start to increase current through the junction, then the phi start to increase, okay, sine phi. Because if you look at the you know, first Joseph equation, then this sine phi has to increase, in, you know, if, so basically this phi equal to arc sine of i divided by ic, right? So when you increase i, then phi has to increase. When phi increase, cosine phi decrease, then you know this inductance increase. Okay? Until the point where you know, phi becomes 90 degree, that is I equal to IC. 
then this, this inductance you know, theoretically goes to infinity. Of course, because you know, the noise and the fluctuations, this, you, know, you will no, never see this. So if you plug this one into you know, Lagrangian uh, of the, you know, the system, and this is what we find, OK? So this is the potential energy of the, of the chosen junction is given by like, you know, a cosine. It's a minus cosine times you know, Ej, OK? So then this, in this potential, it's not harmonic. So it's unharmonic. That means you know, the, the largest energy separation between the levels is from you know, ground state and the first excited state. And you go up, then the energy separation, the level spacing becomes smaller and smaller. So this is a nice feature, because then we can use a microwave which resonates with this, but not resonate with everything else. Okay? Then we can use it to operate the system, initialize the system in the ground state, uh, apply microwave pulses to manipulate the system, and the system will not leave this subspace spanned by the 0 and the 1. Okay? So that's basically that's a qubit. Okay. Uh, so the simplest structure now, and the best one, once people are using, now it's called a transmont qubit. Forget these fancy names, OK? What is a transmont qubit? Transmont qubit basically is just a Joseph junction without, without you know, bias current on it. Okay? There's no DC bias current on it. Why? Because then you don't have to attach leads. You don't have to attach leads to connect it to the, you know, directly, galvanically to you know, external world. So that isolates the system better, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it has less, you know, the fluctuations and noise has less effect on it. That's why, you know, it has relatively long coherence time. Okay, uh, I'll skip all this and just to point out uh, there is a, you know, these are just, you know, the simple calculations you do in the Lagrangian, then you do, you know, the uh, Hamiltonian, uh, find out, you know, what is uh, uh, solved numerically, find out, you know, level spacing, and you can, you can, you know, approximately get these nice equations. So that tells you when you design your qubit, how to design them, you know, what is the ratio of the EJ, EC, okay? So what is EJ and EC? EJ, product of EJ, EC determines, you know, the level spacing, and the you know, ratio of the EJ, EC determines how many levels are in the, you know, in this potential well, okay? Say if you want to, you know, say four levels in the potential well, you want to, you know, say levels spacing to be five gigahertz. These are two, you know, experimentally desired quantity, okay? Then you can translate them into, you know, EJ and EC. Then from EJ and EC, you can, you can translate them into, you know, the capacitance of junction and, you know, the critical current of junction. So that's the way, how do we design it? Uh, just one thing I need to point out, you know, the people sometimes call this is a charge qubit, which is uh, totally wrong because, you know, uh, if you compute what is, you know, the uncertainty of the charge on, the, you know, on this object, you know, it's, it's on the order of 2E. So that's on the order of, you know, one, you know, the, the Cooper pair, okay? If you compute what is, you know, the flux, you know, uh, uncertainty of the flux of this, this object, then it's only 0.1. Five zero, okay. So this is actually is ten times less than that. So uh, it's basically it's a phase qubit, not a charge qubit. Okay. Uh, so next next semester, if somebody you know give a talk and call it you know as a charge qubit, you can ask them this question. <laughs> okay. So why you call it you know charge qubit? You know if if its charge is is so uncertain. Okay. Yeah. No, no, it's not a cool pair w m move to the next stage. Okay. You, have, you have a capacitance, junction. Okay, just think about it. You have two superconducting electrodes separated by a thin insulator, right, there. So what is that? That is a parallel plate capacitor, okay? But that capacitor is not completely insulating, okay? Because in the cool pairs, you can tunnel from one side to the other side, okay? So, but nevertheless, it's a capacitor, you know, you know how, mu how much charge on it determines, you know, its state, okay? But that charge, you know, because it's a quantum mechanical, then if you really compute what is, you know, the, you know, average or expectation value of the charge on this capacitor, 
you know, uncertainties about, you know, one Cooper pair. Basically, you are not sure if, you know, this one Cooper pair, you know, this charge Q is say, zero or is one, okay? So if you, this is similar to the situation of you have a so-called, you know, particle which can be, uh, if, you, if it's, you know, very well localized in, in the space, you can write its, you know, state as a Gaussian function, okay, with X as, you know, its position. Or you can write, you know, as its uh, superposition of the plane waves, right? Plane waves have, plane waves have what? Well-defined momentum, but totally, you know, unspecified position. It's the same thing, it's a Q. Q is basically P, okay? And phi is X, okay? So in this case, X is much more well-defined than the P, okay? So call it, you know, a plane wave is just, you know, it's not right. Okay, so this is just a picture of, of you know, a real device. You know, say so this is a, a size of the device. So the, usually this path is on the order of several hundred micrometers, and this is uh, on the order of, you know, hundred something nanometers width. Then you can figure out, you know, say, changes in here. Then this IV curve. If you measure it, you know, you can find out what is IC. Basically, in this case, you can apply cur uh, current. It, it stays in the zero voltage. This is V, this is in the current, okay? Voltage, current. So you apply from zero, apply current, until this point is switched to the finite voltage. So this point is basically, roughly speaking, is critical current, okay? I see. Now, uh, X one qubit, yeah, it's, it's too slow. So X one qubit basically is just a different geometry for, you know, the trans one qubit. Here, basically we have, it has a, uh, geometry of a cross. Why, why we do this? Because, you know, then we can couple it to several different objects. Like, you know, this one is a superconducting, you know, coplanar resonator, and this one is, a, you know, readout, you know, cavity, etc. Uh, just, you know, it's a make coupling to other, you know, objects more convenient. And here is the measurement of its coherence time. So this is T1 time, Measurement. Uh, basically, we send in a pi pulse to excite it to the you know first excited state. Then we just uh, wait for time of tau. Then you know measure see uh, how much you know it has decayed. Okay, so we do this repeatedly. Then uh, you'll find this you know the x you know uh, so basically it's given by this pi pulse wait. Then just you know measure. Okay, projective measure. And this is uh, so-called uh, Ramsey uh, fringe measurement. Basically, it uh, measures you know, the defacing time. So uh, I I'll skip this, and later, probably uh, if I have time, I'll explain what it is. Okay. So here's a summary of the, you know, all different types of the, you know, the uh, superconducting qubit. SCQ stands for superconducting qubit. So there are, there are phase qubit, you know, the RF squared flux qubit, then we have flux on, this is just some fancy names. Uh, essentially, there are only two types of qubit, okay? One is called a charge qubit. That is, you know, Q is well-defined, and the phase is not well-defined. The second type is, you know, phase or flux, you know, because they are related, you know, just proportional to each other. Now, in, in that qubit, in that type of qubit, the phase or flux is well-defined, but the Q is not well-defined. Everything else is just people, well, giving them some fancy name. Of course, you know, there, there are some legitimate na uh, ones, like uh, quaternium or whatever. In that case, basically, you know, both are, you know, delta Q and delta, delta phi are about equal, okay? So none of them is well-defined. They are about equal, so that's uh, another type. So these are some, you know, their pra parameters. I will not have time to, you know, to explain them. But just that you. So these parameters are what you need to define the initial state of the qubit for uh, a particular No, these these are the these are the typical parameters for for each type of the qubit. Okay, therefore you can you can have a, a level spacing somewhere you know around a few gigahertz. Okay, then also you can have a reasonably you know long coherence time. And these are the basically th these are the you know their electrical uh, circuit parameters, uh, and we use them to you know design different ones. Now.
how do we couple qubit together? I skip this one. This is a, a inductive coupling. I simply talk about you know, the capacitive coupling. Okay. So how do we couple these two qubits? This this is transmit qubit one, transmit qubit two. Then to couple them, all you have to do is just you know connect them and put a capacitor in, in the middle. Okay. And you can write down you know this system uh, Lagrangian, okay, which is easy. Then you do a conversion and convert them into you know, the then transformation. You get in you know, the Hamiltonian of the two systems. Then you see there is a term which has this form. Okay. So n1, n2 basically is you know the uh, is the charge on the you know on the on the qubit one and qubit two. So basically now you have this coupling term. Okay. If you only have you know the term which only has to say this is the term n1 square. Uh, you know, n i i equal to one two. So you have n one square, n two square. That's basically single qubit, right? If you have an isolated qubit, you have this. Now you have this capacitor that couples these two qubit together. Mm -hmm. So you have you know, the coupling term. So the state of one qubit, actually, when you try to do a unit unitary transformation on one qubit, then the effect of that unitary transformation actually depends on the state of the other qubit. Okay. So this is what we want. And we can write them you know, in this way. So this is a, a typical uh, integration uh, we can realize in. But you, you can see, this has, usually this has to be nearest neighbor. Okay? So here is a, a circuit layout. Uh, this one has a six qubit, uh, 12 qubit. Okay? So you can see six on here. This is a six x mark qubit, six x mark qubit here. See, this is like x mark qubit, right? So that's cross, they're all cross. This is the blow up of this region. And these are the, you know, the planar superconducting uh, resonators, OK, which used to basically store you know, the, the information of, the, of this qubit and the letter uh, being read out by the you know, uh, you know, non quantum non diminishing read readout method. So you can, you can think of this as a, as a you know, memory cell associated with each qubit. So once uh, we, we got a state, then we can swap the state of the qubit into the resonator. Uh, resonator usually has a longer in the coherence time than you know, the qubit itself. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we can keep it there longer without, without you know, the degradation. And then we can you know, read it out uh, state. So this is a tunable qubit. Basically, we can apply a flux into this you know, small loop, which is shown here. See, here's a loop. These are two junctions. Okay? <laughs> one junction is here, one junction is here. Then this is a loop. So if we change the flux applied to this loop, okay, then it, it effectively changes the critical current of, the, you know, the, of this, this two junction system. Okay? So when we change that, as you can see, we change EJ. When EJ changes, then EC is fixed, OK? The magnetic field is not going to change the capacitance. So EJ changes, EC stays put, then, then you know, we can tune the, you know, the, the energy of the level spacing, or the, you know, sometimes called transition frequency of the qubit. Okay? So now, circuit QED. Circuit QED, uh, <coughs> basically, this is uh, First proposed by uh, my postdoc at that time, you know, Dr. Uh, Yang, and the Chu is uh, Shi Yi Chu in the chemistry department, and uh, this is me. So we first proposed it in the 2003. Okay, however, uh, there's a long story. Okay, but we are not the first to you know to observe it or realize it in the in the experiment. Mm -hmm. Okay, because the student. I assigned to do this, uh, got into some personal trouble, then finally quit. So it's very bad. Then, then you know, the war ref uh, in Yale, at that time, he was a postdoc. Okay? Now it's, he's also a famous professor in ETH, Zurich. And you know, they, they observed it first, you know, experimentally. So uh, I, I'll skip with the detail of this, uh, because my time is almost up. Uh, so basically, what we can do is to say, here is a, here is the cavity. This there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cavities on, on this chip, right? 
There are six qubits, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay? So as this is as before, right? Each qubit has its own memory resonator. So which can store its information, okay? Store its state in this resonator. For in the second qubit stored in here, this qubit stored in here. This middle one, middle one is used to couple, you know, to in initiate a, you know, the cavity mediated coupling between any two of these qubits, I and J. Okay? So in this way, the coupling is not, not limited to nearest neighbor only. It can be effectively like, you know, like a long range, you know, uh, arbitrary pairwise, you know, coupling. So you can couple these two, you can couple these two, you can couple any two of them, I and J. Okay? Because they're all, you know, each qubit are, you know, all the qubits are also coupled to this resonator. The resonator, you know, functioning as a, as an intermediary, intermediary. Okay, so uh, when we need to couple, say, the first qubit to the third qubit, all we have to do is to adjust the frequency of the first qubit and the third qubit, you know, to the same frequency. Okay, uh, if all the other qubits are at a different frequency, then only these two qubits interact at that time. Okay. Now, once we finish you know, this two qubit operation, we change the frequency to so-called idle frequency. Then we bring some other qubit into interaction. So that's the way. How do we do it? Actually, this cannot. You know, if we, we can do this, you know, simultaneously, say so we, we uh, you know have six qubit, we have three pairs. Each of them have the same frequency, but different from the other pairs, right? In this way, actually, all these three pairs can interact. You know at the same time, simultaneously. We don't have to do them sequentially. You know, it can be done you know, in, in parallel. So this is a, a picture of the cavities we use, actually, you know, uh, in, in our lab. This is aluminum cavity. This is, uh, you know, the copper cavity. The size of the cavity is something like this big, OK? It's, it's, it's about, about the half of this, just like this, OK? So this, this box. And the frequency of this, uh, resonant frequency of the lowest mode, that's this one. This is 7.85 gigahertz. Okay, then we can put a chip signal in, just put it in the center of this cube, you know, this cavity, close them, you know, screw them together. That's it. Okay, so that, that's a 3D cavity with a qubit in it. Uh, quantum logic gate. Now, because I only have, you know, at the most five minutes, uh, I just you know the skip all this just simply show you there are several you know uh, important single qubit gates uh, X Y Z basically if you you have learned in the quantum mechanics you can immediately call this is what this is sigma X sigma Y sigma Z right so basically that 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 cause you know the steady vector to rotate on the you know the on the block sphere okay about X axis or Y axis or Z axis. And uh, this is called you know, the, the uh, S gate, uh, T gate. It's basically just you know, changing the phase of the system by you know, this by pi over 2, this by you know, pi over 4. Sometimes it's called the 4 pi, you know, pi over 4 gates, pi over 8 gates. And this is the uh, most famous you know, the Hadamard gates. Hadamard gates basically can, you know, changes 0 to 1 and 1 to, uh, to minus 0. Okay? So basically, Hadamard gas, you can use the Hadamard gas to, uh, to convert a state which is originally in the, in the, you know, in the ground state to a you know, maximum or equal superposition of 0 and 1. Okay. Uh, single qubit rotation. So I, I will not you know, explain this in detail. Basically, I mean the, uh, in the 2D Hilbert space, so uh, a rotation operator, right? Rotating the state vector is basically you know the spin or the sigma operator. Okay, so it gives you a rotation described by this. Uh, in this case, for example, if you know I started my state here, then I want to end up in here. The angle between this is theta. Angle between here, you know this as the angle is, is theta. Then we have we have to apply this you no know, rotation. Okay, so first we rotate it you know about the Y axis by an uh, angle of theta, then we rotate about the uh, Z axis by an uh, angle of phi. 
And uh, in, in the real space, basically what we do it is that we have a magnetic moment in a magnetic field. Then you write down the interacting Hamiltonian, okay? Then you can, you know, if this, this B field is time independent, then we can have this, uh, you know, the propagator of the system, which is a unitary. And you can see, you compare this from here and this. They are exactly have the same, you know, have exactly the same form, okay? So basically we can use magnetic field to rotate, you know, the magnetic moment in, in real space. Uh, Rabi oscillation, then this is uh, basically to use. So one question I often you know, ask my student is, you know, how do you create a, in the lab, how do you create a rotating, you know, very, uh, rotating magnetic field, which is you know, rotating at, say, gigahertz frequency, okay, speed. Uh, you, you can't just you know, take a, you know, the magnet bar and you just you know, turn it you know, very, very, very rapidly, right? The easiest way, of course, is to just you know, apply a field along the x direction, another one in along y direction. Each of them are just, you know, the, they're off by you know, 90 degree in phase. You know, that creates a rotating magnetic field. And if you solve this whole problem, then you find out you know, then that in the rotation, you know, the uh, frame of reference, then this is uh, basically uh, the field along this direction, along the x direction, rotates the, the spin about the x axis. Okay, the field, you know, you apply it around the y direction, rotates the you know magnetic moment around the, you know, the y axis. Okay, so in that case, basically we can you know, separate them like you know. Usually we call this in phase. This is out of phase or quadrature. Okay. So this, which is 90 degree off, out of the phase with this. So that's the uh, I in phase and the quadratic term. By control these two terms, we can control this spin on the, you know, the block sphere to, you know, to the place, uh, any, any place we want. So here's an experimental setup. Uh, I'll skip all these details. It's basically just you know, some uh, mixers, you know, the IQ mixers, uh, Circulators, it has already, these are all in the microwave components. Uh, if we are not in the, the really want to do experiment, you do, need, do not need to know this. Uh, just, just show you we have the ways, okay, very well, you know, to control the system uh, very well, okay. So, uh, two qubit gates. Okay, so this is so called in the most famous, you know, the control knot gate, C knot. Basically, you know, the state of the, uh, <laughs> the effect of the operation on the second qubit, this one, depends on the state of this, this qubit, okay? So this is a control qubit, it's target qubit. So if, you know, if it's zero, zero, then it goes to zero, zero. That means if the control qubit is, is in the zero state, nothing happens to the, you know, target qubit. If a control qubit is in the one state, okay, here, one, one, then it flips, you know, the, the target qubit, okay? So, uh, we only need this one. Of course, you know, there's a, a lot of, you know, two, di two uh, different two qubit gates, like, you know, control the Z gates, control the phase gate, et cetera, okay? They, they all can be used to, you know, do this, but, you know, control now is, uh, is the most famous one. And uh, so I skip all this. And uh, this one just shows you how to, how to use, you know, superconducting uh, circuit to implement this, okay? So this is in the, in the context of the uh, circuit QED, then the two qubits are coupled, you know, through the, through the cavity, okay? Uh, I, I think I only have one minute, so I'll skip all this. Uh, these are state of R two qubit gates. Uh, Decoherence, this has to have to you know, have at least one slide for this, okay? Now you say, oh, everything is you know, perfect, right? So where is your quantum computer? You should have, you know, get it done, built, you know, a long time ago, right? Why? How, how come, you know, we still don't have it? Because there's, you know, noise and, you know, the fluctuations, which, you know, destroys coherence, okay? Once the coherence is gone, then basically, you know, this, this 50 qubits becomes 50, you know, uh, classical switches, you know, zero and one. Uh, you know, there's no advantage. It means it's much worse you know, than your, than your you know, the, uh, even the oldest you know, smartphone, okay? So, uh, 
So there are two effects. Okay? One, one is you know, it causes the system to, to, to spontaneously decay from the excited state to the ground state. So that's usually we call you know, the characteristic decay time is called T1. Uh, this, this language I borrowed from the NMR. Okay? Uh, then there's also you know, the so-called defacing is you know, illustrated by this. So if your state vector is on x, y plane, when you, you know, pr uh, process about the z-axis in the finite you know, the magnetic field, then you can see uh, they are going to spread out. Okay? So once it spread out over a certain time, then it will spread out, you know, becomes almost like a uniformly distributed on the x, y plane. Then there's, you know, it's basically becomes, you know, whole, becomes a, a classical mixture of, of the, you know, ensembles. There's, you know, then the, the coherence is all, you know, lost. So currently, so this is just a measurement result. This one measures T1. Uh, the characteristic decay time of this is a T2. Okay, so the defacing time. Uh, the longest one now is about T1 and the T2 are both on the order of uh, couple of hundred micro, microsecond, okay? Which is actually, you can say, it's, it's very short, but actually it's not very short. You know, it's, it's almost good enough for us to do, you know, to build a real quantum computer, but still we need to go another factor of five, probably. But remember, okay, 20 years ago, when we started this whole business, the decoherence time is one nanosecond, okay? So we are already made a, Factor of 10 to the 5, you know, progress. If you plot that, it almost also looks like you know Moore's law. Okay, over the 20 years of the of this, you know, so here's the plot. Okay, we started from about one nanosecond, then we now come to place something like 100 microsecond, several hundred microsecond. So if you look at this, is a semi-log plot. It's also like you know, approximately a straight line. Okay, so. Uh, we're optimistic that you know, in a couple of years we should be able to push it to you know to the uh, to something like a millisecond. Uh, once that milestone is reached, then uh, it should be tech, you know techni technologically feasible to build some you know the uh, useful quantum computers. Okay. Now, so what is the current status? Uh, so if you have you know paid some attention to this field, then this is uh, this is announced or published on October 23, which is about a month ago. Okay, so the Google's uh, uh, Google's team published this 53 qubit. They're called the Sacmore chip. Okay, it's a Sacmore processor. This is a picture, you know, false colored picture of that that chip. So they they use a benchmarking. The benchmarking they use is you know sample. You know, one instance of uh, this quantum circuit, one million times. Okay, then from this, you know, sampling, try to figure out what, you know, distributions of the state is. Okay, so to do this, uh, the, the, this, this quantum processor uses 200 seconds. Okay, three minutes and 20, 20 seconds, and the, uh, there's no, of course, you know, the summit. I just mentioned before, right? That's the uh, you know, currently most powerful supercomputer in the world. Uh, it will, you know, it will take 10 to the fourth years or 10,000 years to do it. But you said uh, that they obviously didn't the wrong summit for 10,000 years. So how do they know this number? They basically they uh, <coughs> they reduce the size of the problem. Say they start from 20 qubits or 30 qubits, then you know use a summit to do it. Then you know increase the number of size, then see what is the scaling. Okay, then if you you know extrapolate that scaling to the you know 53, that's you know 10,000 years. Okay, so uh, so where we are, we are basically you know at here. Now next step is you know to go to this level, but in order to go to this level, we have to further increase you know the coherence time of the of the qubit. Uh, so these are some future directions. Uh, so that's my talk. Uh, oh, just just use all times. Okay. Thank you for listening.